to get started and folks will be welcome to join and come in along the way. Um, I'll be adding some messages in the chat with instructions for anyone who does arrive late. Um, but officially, I would like to welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining us for today's talk. Uh, my name is Katie Petroli. I am the Director of Education here at the Nashville Parthenon, where I'm coming to you today. This talk is part of a project um, that is the Annie Kithera Mechanism Exhibit and our Summer Symposia series, which is funded in part by a grant from Humanities Tennessee. And Humanities Tennessee is an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's also sponsored by Centennial Park Conservancy and Metro Parks um, and Recreation here in Nashville. And this is the first of our three summer symposia. So these three talks will expand upon the big idea and the message of our newest temporary exhibit, which is the Annie Kithera mechanism. So it's all about an underwater artifact and how archaeologists have been studying it and learning it and changing their interpretations of this artifact over the past 100 years. So I recommend coming to the Nashville Parthenon if you're able to explore the gallery. Or alternatively, we will have a digital exhibit, a digital version of the gallery up on our website, which is nashvilleparthenon.com, and that will be available soon. So check our website for our digital exhibit. And the, the three talks that we're focusing on this summer, um, there's some different topics. So today's will be about major underwater archaeological discoveries with the one and only Dr. Stephen L. Tuck. Our next talk will be July 21st, and it's all about showing archaeological conservation's importance with the head conservator from the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, Greece, Dr. Georgiana Moraitu. And our third will be sharing about archaeological practices, both on land and underwater, with archaeologist Anne DeRay on August 18th. So all three of those are free and open to the public. I uh, hope you'll join us for all three. And registration is up and available. I can uh, email out links for the following two talks as well. And all three fit our mission of basically um, trying to increase the knowledge of archaeology and the ancient world. So that's part of our mission here at the Nashville Parthenon. And we're so excited to have the support from Humanities Tennessee to fulfill our mission. So that means today during our talk, we are inviting you to use the chat feature, which is below on your screen, and the Q&A feature also at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. You can ask questions to Dr. Tuck at any point during the talk. And after the presentation, we will be going through and discussing those questions to make sure that your participation is rewarded by discussing all those burning questions you have about some major underwater archaeological discoveries. And I will be in contact to share a recording of this talk. Um, I will also be in contact to send a survey of this talk that will help evaluate this program. So um, just a shameless plug here that completing the survey is incredibly important for us to not only improve our programming, but also to share results with folks like Humanities Tennessee reporting on the effectiveness of our programming and, um, and how we are serving our audiences. So please consider uh, spending just a couple minutes when it reaches your inbox to fill out our digital survey. And I will be eternally grateful <laughs> and uh, ready to say thank you a million times on behalf of the Nashville Parthenon. So with all those housekeeping notes said, it is time to get started. I will do a short introduction of Dr. Tuck. He will take it away and share his screen with our presentation. And we will come back at the end with questions about today's presentation. So Stephen L. Tuck is a professor at, um, of history and classics at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, where he has taught since 2001. He received his PhD in classical art and archaeology from the University of Michigan after a BA in history and classics from Indiana University. He is the author of A History of Roman Art and many articles and chapters on Roman art, especially Roman sculpture. And he also publishes on Latin epigraphy, including research tracing survivors from the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79, 
And I've got to mention, he has a talk about this exact topic coming up on July 17th. It's not affiliated with our museum, but I think after today, you'll realize you want to join again for another talk with um, Dr. Tuck here. So he also researches sculpture and inscriptions specifically um, that focus on spectacle entertainments in the Roman world. And he has received nine undergraduate teaching awards, including the Archaeological Institute of America Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award. And I can personally vouch for his teaching prowess as a former student of his at Miami University, which means um, I really cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to today's talk and hearing about underwater archaeological discoveries. Dr. Tuck will be sharing about decorating the emperor's dining rooms, underwater discoveries, and changing understanding. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Katie. I assume you can all still hear me. And um, let me see if I can manage the screen share, because that's the other part of the technology, because otherwise I'll be doing this through um, Oh, I guess, um, you know, uh, hand puppets or something. So if nobody says otherwise, um, I am, I'm hoping it's all working. Excellent. All right. Well, I was really excited when Katie uh, invited me to speak because I love underwater archaeology. My, my um, uh, PhD dissertation was actually on uh, the remains of Roman harbors and harbor monuments, which was really kind of a boondoggle. It gave me... Um, an opportunity to visit uh, beaches around the Mediterranean. But it, uh, it introduced me to underwater archaeology, and it's been a love that um, really has not gone away in the last uh, 30 years. It's, it's in, in many ways, as long as my family is not watching this, um, it's been my most um, enjoyable long-term adult relationship. So um, there's that. All right, well, let's get started. I wanted to focus today on, um, on two sites of um, of underwater um, archaeology, and they are both um, related by, um, well, as you'll see, and as it says in the title, uh, being uh, dining rooms of Roman emperors. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Um, the first of these is the site which is known today, as it was in the ancient world, as Sperlonga. If you're looking at this map of Italy here on the left, here on the west coast of Italy, about two thirds of the way down in red, you see Sperlonga there. It's about, if you look in the lower right here, about halfway between Naples and Rome on the Tyrrhenian or western coast there. And there's a photo of what it looks like today. Um, the site is actually, has been excavated pretty extensively since its discovery and has been found to be a seaside villa of the second Roman emperor, Tiberius. But actually, its discovery is a great story. It was only discovered in 1957. Nobody knew this entire imperial villa was here. In particular, what's most remarkable about this site is the centerpiece of the villa is the emperor's dining room which was this grotto, this natural cave. Well, in 1957, the Italian government hired surveyors to go along the coast and to survey for a new coastal highway. And as they came along the coast, what they found here was this cave. And looking into the cave, they found a big pool of water. And in that pool of water were thousands of fragments of sculpture smashed to pieces and scattered all underwater there um, inside the cave and a bit outside. Well, this again was only in 1957, and they immediately started excavating, scooping these up. And this is a photograph from early in the excavations when they just had thousands of fragments, things from, well, as large as perhaps two or three feet to as small as just an inch or two. What's remarkable about this is it's a massive 3D jigsaw puzzle project because the, sculpt, the, the sculptural fragments come from a whole variety of sculpture groups. And so they sorted them and then started putting them together. And here you can see some of the work 
using a lot of glue and a lot of, of metal supports of them trying to piece together these sculptural fragments into the original groups. Now, when these were first discovered, um, they found parts of this group here, and they found these um, struggling figures with the hands and these curving parts, and it reminded um, the excavators of this famous sculpture, the Laocoon. Oh man, I mispronounced Laocoon. You're going to take away my PhD here. Um, the Laocoon, which is in the Vatican Museum. Um, and they thought they had another copy of the Laocoon. So it turned out they didn't, but they were close. They just didn't know it. It turned out they had a sculpture group here, which when they finished putting it together, and here you can see some of the fragments that were all um, re, um, reconstructed, it has um, signatures of the sculptors on it. And they're the same sculptors that sculpted the Laocoon, at least according to um, Pliny the Elder, who tells us the, the names of the sculptors here. And these are the same guys who sculpted this piece as well. And so already understanding of these is beginning to build. Well, very quickly, what they realized, and by very quickly, I mean quickly in terms of archeology, span it took about six years. <laughs> and, what they realized is that this um, grotto, this cave, was not just a cave with sculpture groups in it. It was a famous cave. This is the location of the villa, as I said, of the Emperor Tiberius, who ruled from 14 to 37. And this was a famous location of Tiberius's villa, where in fact he was dining one night. And here you can see the, the cave as it is today with the dining platform here and a cave in occurred. And his life was spared because the commander of his bodyguard threw himself over Tiberius and saved him from um, the rocks that fell from the cave roof. And uh, he himself was almost killed but um, cemented his position with the emperor by saving his life. And so we know about this grotto dining room. We know about the events that took place here, thanks to the survival of the historical sources. And gradually they put this together. They excavated uh, the dining room and the attached villa, and then started reassembling the sculpture groups. There's many sculpture groups because this villa was actually occupied by the emperors for over 400 years. Um, but we're going to just take a look at um, the original sculpture groups that were put here under Tiberius. And those are the ones that are on this reconstruction here, labeled A, B, C, and D, as understood by the excavators. Um, and we'll take a look at what we have here. In the back of the cave, furthest away from the dining platform, which is actually this rectangular platform here. So the, the diners who came over to, to dine with the emperor would recline on couches as you would in the Roman world. And they would face this sculpture group in the cave with their backs to the sea. Um, and so it faces west. So it would be lit by that, um, by that afternoon sun. It's really a wonderful sight. Um, and so group B back here, is the blinding of the Cyclops Polyphemus, a famous event from um, Homer's Odyssey. And there's the Polyphemus, the, the Cyclops all um, sprawled out with a drinking cup under his hand. And there's um, Odysseus and his man about to blind him so they can escape from the cave. It's a wonderful image of um, dining in a dining room set in a cave. Nice, huh? Gets better. The second of the large groups, A, right here in the center, is the image of Scylla. Now here's a reconstruction with the fragments all put together in this matrix of plaster and steel, um, steel structure, but here's actually a, a plaster model of it. So you can see what it probably looked like a little more clearly. This is kind of a Rorschach test of a, of a sculpture group. And this is also a scene familiar from the Odyssey of, um, of Scylla, the great sea monster who consumed sailors who passed by on ships, um, grabbing them and dragging them into her cave to eat them. 
And there you can see her. And she was also set up here in a cave. Again, an image in a cave, set up in a cave with um, dining taking place. And then there's two smaller groups that are actually pretty much light size groups. The so-called um, C, the palladium group, which is right here. And this is the image of somebody carrying the image of Pallas Athena. It's an ancient sacred statue of the goddess Athena that came from the city of Troy and um, brought with it, um, well, essentially Trojan culture um, transmitted out of Troy. And then D is the Pasquino group. You can see the fragments of it here and then a reconstruction there. And that was set up here. And it's a warrior holding the body of, of a dying warrior, about which more in just a bit. Well, after these were excavated and reassembled and studied, um, the excavators decided that what they had were images from um, Homer's Odyssey, from the Iliad, and from altogether from the cycle of the Trojan War. And so um, if you go to the site today, you'll see, or if you read the guidebook that you buy on the site today, you'll see that this is introduced as the blinding of Polyphemus, as it's described in Homer's Odyssey in book nine. Um, and um, it's pretty close, except it's not really that close. It's interesting. And so the excavator said, well, you know, it's, it's not a documentary. It's not a snapshot of Homer's Odyssey. It's, a, it's an illusion. It's elusive to that image. It's not exactly the same. OK, that's fair. Um, and similarly with the image of the Scylla, um, they argued um, that this was the image from Homer's Odyssey of Scylla attacking um, Odysseus's men and consuming them. Um, and as you can see from book 12, or from Butler's translation of book 12, um, she had 12 feet, six necks, three rows of teeth, not exactly the same figure. Um, but again, the excavators argued, well, you know, it's not a, you know, it's not an exact illustration. It's elusive to Homer's Odyssey. And this actually satisfied most everybody for quite a long time from essentially 1963, when they first proposed this, um, right up to about 2010. And then when 2010 came up, um, actually, I will tell you, um, I became dissatisfied with this excavation um, suggestion or interpretation because I was teaching this. I was standing here in front of it with a group of students. We're reading Homer's Odyssey and it just didn't work. This was not the illustration in Homer's Odyssey. It turned out, however, it's an almost exact um, description of Virgil's Aeneid and the same event, but in Virgil's Aeneid. Does this matter? Well, I don't know. It matters to me. I think it mattered to Tiberius because what we find we have, I think instead, is the emperor not decorating his dining room with images of stories from the great Greek epic, but instead images from the great Roman national epic. And that makes a lot more sense for an emperor's palace and the space here. And the description that we have in Virgil's Aeneid of um, the Cyclops with his neck bent sideways, twisted here rather than back, um, the men surrounding him on all sides, the number of men, the action, and so forth, actually matches Virgil's version a lot more closely. Similarly, with the Scylla. The Scylla, as described and in Virgil's Aeneid, matches almost exactly the image that we have here. Fair-breasted woman down to um, her flanks or haunches or whatever you call. And then below that, she has dolphins and wolves. And she does. She has the, the feet of dolphins here, and she has wolves coming out at her waist. It matches Virgil's version of this in the Aeneid. And so what we 
finally, I think can argue, and this has been largely accepted um, by, um, well, by most right thinking people, I'd like to say, but you know, we can argue that, um, is that um, we don't have images of, um, of um, Homer's Odyssey. We have images of Virgil's Aeneid. What's really exciting about these is that they are myth. They're images from literature or mythology that actually go even further and don't just illustrate events in literature, but they actually illustrate something even more remarkable. Events in mythological literature used by Roman politicians to convey a message. And the reason we know that is that because slightly before the building of this villa, actually when Tiberius was a small boy, um, was a civil war um, held um, between Tiberius's adopted father, Augustus, and Sextus Pompey, the son of Pompey the Great. They fought a civil war here that lasted for about seven years. Um, Pompey, Sextus Pompey, took over Sicily and Sardinia and raided the coast where we are right here, and essentially um, created this little Roman empire for himself in Southern Italy, Sicily, and Sardinia down here, a breakaway Roman empire. He, because it was a civil war, had a lot of propaganda. He proclaimed himself to be the son of Neptune. He conflated his identity with that of Polyphemus, who was in fact the son of Neptune and was in Sicily. He struck coins that showed Scylla as his emblem. Scylla here with her, um, this is the, the steering oar that you use on a ship and she's using it to, to smash um, the enemy vessels as they go by. This is the image of Scylla that we have here on, um, in, um, in Sperlonga. And so what Tiberius seems to have done here is to pick two events that are in Virgil's Aeneid, which are also uh, images used by Sextus Pompey in the Civil War to, um, um, well, to celebrate his side as his propaganda images. Now, you might ask yourself quite reasonably, I think, um, would anybody know, you know that these were images from that Civil War because it was over 50 years ago? And I would argue, yes, they would. It was in Tiberius's lifetime and the lifetime of his, um, well, his contemporaries, of course. Um, but I, I admit that my, um, I'm biased on this because um, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm in Decatur, Georgia. I'm about, well, less than 10 miles from Stone Mountain. And I can tell you, um, over 100 years after the Civil War, um, there's imagery here um, that people are going to recognize as imagery of civil war over a hundred years later. Will people still recognize the images used by Sextus Pompey to celebrate his side in the civil war 50 years later? I think so. More importantly, however, I think there's a great message going on here, which has been, I think, um, misunderstood. Well, actually not recognized at all would be closer, but in Virgil's Aeneid, there's a moment in the beginning of the epic when our hero Aeneas turns to his men who are somewhat, well, let's face it, demoralized. Having escaped Troy, their city is wiped out. They just survived a great um, shipwreck, a great storm sent by Neptune. They're washed aboard, uh, ashore uh, in Africa. And he gives them a pep talk. The, um, the big pep talk speech. If you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy, you see the same thing. Chris Pratt does it, but not as well, of course, because he's not Virgil. But anyway, um, he tells his men, that is Aeneas, not Chris Pratt. Aeneas tells his men, you face Scylla, you face Cyclops, everything's going to be better. Those are the past, things now are better. And so these two events from the past are brought up as events of things that we have made it through. And they're deliberately celebrated as um, things that we have successfully overcome. 
Now, the question, of course, is would anybody have gotten this reference? And in, and in fact, we have evidence that people would have. Um, Tiberius' successor, Gaius Caligula, used this exact line coming back to the dining table one day. Um, and he admonished his fellow diners in, as is said, that notable line of Virgil, that notable verse of Virgil's, bear up and save yourself for better times. So already by the time of Tiberius's successor, this was a famous line. And it's something that people are just, well, dropping and at least in certain um, company, expecting people to understand. Now, the idea that a dining room would be decorated with imagery from mythology that everybody is just supposed to understand, I appreciate, is a little, well, we, we, um, we got a question that. And I want to point out, actually, that there's some excellent evidence that the Romans, at least certain elite educated Romans, were just supposed to understand this sort of thing. And as an extreme example, here's a Roman villa dining room from the Villa at Lulling Stone in Britain from four or, or 350 CE from the fourth century. And it's got a grotto niche in the dining room. And in that niche, in that little apse, there's a mosaic. And that mosaic has a caption, which is a couplet in the verse form of the Roman poet Ovid, who was contemporary with Tiberius, so about you know 350 years before this was done. And they, the author of this uses Ovid's verse form and makes an allusion to the first book of Virgil's Aeneid to illustrate this image of Europa and the bull. Never tells us that it's Europa and the bull. There's no caption that it says that. It's just an allusion of Juno's jealousy and her travels to the halls of Aeolus, a famous event in book one of the Aeneid. So I think it's pretty clear that Roman diners were supposed to examine the, um, the illustrations in these dining rooms and understand the significance of them, the symbolic representations, the mythological metaphor, if you will, or actually, if I will, I love alliteration. Not only is there mythological metaphor in dining rooms, it's used in public areas as well. I think one of the most famous um, examples of this is in uh, Tiberius's stepfather's Temple of Apollo, that is Augustus's Temple of Apollo in Rome from just before this villa is constructed. And he illustrated the Temple of Apollo, the, actually the entire sanctuary of Apollo, with imagery which is supposed to show people who commit acts of impiety being punished. You are impious and you're punished, including the daughters of Danaeus, who are mythological metaphor for Cleopatra. This is a story that occurred in Egypt. One of the daughters of Danaeus in mythology is named Cleopatra. Augustus can't show Cleopatra and celebrate his victory over her and Antony, but he can allude to it. And so mythological metaphor is a common practice used in both public and private spaces. And I think the emperor is using it in his dining room. He is illustrating imagery of that past civil war, which they have survived and, um, and gone past. And at the same time, using it using the illustrations from Virgil's Aeneid to make the point that um, this is Rome's national epic. We are Romans. It's a real unifying Roman national statement. And that's just those two large groups. Well, what about the small ones? Well, here also, I think um, a reevaluation is in order. The Palladium group has always been understood by the excavators as an image of, um, again, the Trojan War and of Greek heroes. But actually, there's a Roman version. And in the Roman version, it's Aeneas who actually carried the Palladium um, 
and brought it into Rome. And we have that image in a number of sources, including this marvelous image here from an Etruscan cinerary urn with Aeneas standing there. And there he is as part of this group with the Palladium. And so I think that this isn't the Greeks taking the Palladium out of Troy. I think this is Aeneas bringing the Palladium into Rome. The Pesquino group also is always, well, this one is great. This one's like a Rorschach test. It's, you know, what you see and it really tells us more about you than, than about um, the group because uh, it's rather generic. And um, art historians have argued that it's Menelaus and Patroclus, Priam and Hector, Odysseus and Achilles, Ajax and Achilles, really any pair of figures um, from the Trojan War of a Greek warrior carrying a body off the battlefield. But Anne Weiss has argued instead that it's not any of these things. This is Aeneas from Book 10 of the Aeneid carrying Lausus off the battlefield, extending his right hand and raising the boy up from the ground. Again, it matches the description and the action in Virgil's Roman epic more than it does any of the descriptions in Homer's. So what we seem to have is four sculpture groups down here in the um, grotto, which are allusions to Aeneas, making us think about Rome's nationalism, Rome's epic, and trials past. Just to remind you of the sequence of the Roman emperors of the first century, there's Tiberius's rule, and we're going to quickly skirt over, I've mentioned Caligula already, and Claudius, to the rule of the emperor Nero, who's undergoing something of a, um, of a restoration of reputation at the moment, I've noticed in, um, in um, the public. Um, just south of Sperlonga, down here on the Bay of Naples, just up there on the north side of the Bay of Naples, inside the whole bay is a small bay called the Bay of Bayad. And this was a resort in the ancient Roman world, which included a lot of, um, um, it was a place where people went to take the waters because there were, there were therapeutic springs here and people would go to take the waters. And they built villas down here and had all kinds of luxurious housing and essentially vacation homes. This is an aerial view of the Bay of Baiae today. And um, what I want you to see is if you can look really closely underwater, you can see the changes in color here because the modern shoreline isn't the ancient shoreline. The ancient shoreline is actually out here, far out. And if you look really closely at this group here, what you see is a whole series of buildings underwater as the ground here has sunk and the water has come in, changing the shoreline, much of the resort and um, luxury um, establishments here from Baiae are underwater. And part of that here at the point of Punta Epitaphio is a villa from about 58, which belonged to the emperors, at this point to the emperor um, Nero. And this, shows you the thermal springs, the, that's fumes from the hot springs here. There's the ruins of the buildings out there. This is a nice old um, woodcut of this um, from um, the 17th century. This is a shot from the rediscovery of these buildings because in 1969, divers came down here and discovered the remains of this Roman villa including sculpture just standing there where it had always been in niches along the wall, still there in 1969. Well, as I've mentioned, archaeology sometimes takes a while to get going. This was discovered in 1969, but it wasn't actually excavated till 1980. And when they came down here in the 80s, what they did was they discovered an entire um, underwater Roman villa mosaic floors, walls, and these marvelous sculptures, which were part of the dining room group. They brought this up 
And in a 15th century castle nearby, they converted one of the rooms in the castle into a copy of the dining room. And what it is, is it's a fake grotto dining room that the emperor had made to copy the grotto at Sperlonga. It has water features like at Sperlonga. It has room for dining couches and it has niches along the walls here for sculpture and a big fake grotto niche there for a sculpture group in the center. And you would dine and recline facing each other um, and have that great sculpture group there and the sculptures four on each side behind you. And this is the, um, the reproduction in the, um, in the castle at Bayai. It's really a wonderful setup if you get to go see it someday. Um, and what we have at the very end in that niche is a scene from that same event of the Cyclops. This is the scene before um, they blind him when they are still getting him drunk. Here's the guy with the wine skin squeezing out wine into a cup and there's um, Odysseus himself holding the wine cup. And these figures are really wonderful. Unfortunately, um, chewed up a bit by sea worms um, having been underwater for several centuries, but still looking pretty good. I love that cup. Um, the cup is beautifully carved. And if you look, it's got that strangely heavy strut underneath it. This is actually plumbed. Um, it's a fountain. And so water, or according to some experts, wine would, um, would pour out of this in the dining room. I really want it to be wine, but I think water is probably more likely. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's all, it's a fountain group. Um, and so we've got two figures that survive. The Cyclops figure does not, unfortunately. And then in those niches along the side walls, we had two images of the god Dionysus, perfectly appropriate for a dining room where you're feasting and drinking wine. There's one of the Dionysus figures as he is cleaned up in the, um, in the castle. And here he is as discovered still right where they left him in his niche in the dining room underwater there. And along with those two images of Dionysus, there were six other sculptures, which are really interesting because they are portraits of the Julio Claudian family, but many of them as images from mythology. There's Antonia as Venus Genetrix, so Venus, the, the founder of the family. There's Venus with a little Cupid there, uh, and that's as she was excavated, and here she is in the museum. There's a wonderful image of her diadem, and you can see that just uh, the wonderful um, preservation of this figure. There's no doubt who this is. We have coins that show Antonia, Augusta. This is the, the mother of, um, of the emperor um, Claudius here as a deity. There is um, Claudius's daughter, um, Nero's sister, adopted sister, Claudia Augusta, as a, as a figure of Psyche. Here she is as she was discovered, and here she is in the museum. Um, wonderful little figure of this uh, figure of Claudia, and she has this these great comma-shaped um, bangs and sideburns, which we see on Nero's portraiture. Her portraiture is carved deliberately to look like the current emperor, her adopted brother, Nero. And here she is, her identity conflated with that of Psyche, the soul. Um, this is a posthumous portrait of her, um, as is the, the image of Antonia, a posthumous portrait. Well, it turns out when you look at all these fragments, just to give away the ending here, that this sculpture group isn't just a portrait group of um, Nero and Claudius's entire family, it's Nero and Claudius's entire family as a portrait group, all also um, the posthumous members with their identities combined with that of deities. Um, we have, um, um, Claudia Augusta as, um, as Psyche. We have Antonia as Venus Genetrix. Um, there was an Augustus figure here 
as a god. And we know that because we have actually the forearm. That's all we have of that Augustus figure that survives. There was the figure of Livia um, here. And so all of these figures that we know of from this wonderful relief from Ravenna were found here as well, along with Claudia um, Augusta. And so this became a marvelous display combining images of mythology with the portraiture of um, the family of Nero, all the posthumous members of whom had been, um, at least informally, deified here. And so the dining room here at Punta Epitavio, I think is really a remarkable um, underwater discovery because it shows us not just how the emperor decorated his dining room, but it shows us um, the, the continuity of the form of decoration that we had at Sperlonga, that first grotto dining room replicated here um, three emperors later um, by Nero. And actually it continues on. We see the same thing um, in the dining rooms of the emperors Hadrian and um, Maximian, uh, both of whom take this same imagery and use it in the second and fourth centuries to, to um, decorate their dining rooms, to create this sense of continuity about what it meant to be an emperor and to use this mythological imagery, which I think we now understand far better. And so um, that's what I wanted to leave you with in this, um, in this talk, is that this is a process. And we are, like with the Antikythera mechanism, constantly reevaluating and learning new things about this material as it comes up, gets studied, restudied, and, um, and re-understood um, um, by well, generations of scholars. Thanks very much. And um, I'd be happy to take questions if people have them. If Katie is still there. Hey. <laughs> yes, of course, I'm still here. Hey. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Tuck. I've just dropped a line in the chat for a reminder that if you do have questions or something you're wondering about, something you would like to ask, you're welcome to use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen or the Q&A feature. And Professor Chuck, you might like to check that Q&A feature in case you see any questions that well, I'm, I don't I'm refreshing right now, I it on uh, constantly. I'm I'm on it. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, here we I go. don't know as I'm lucky enough to work in the Parthenon, I have, you know, of course been through our Annie Kithera mechanism exhibit and to me I just kept thinking about how um how important it is to you know, work on initial interpretations of something like dining room sculpture or, you know, this underwater analog computer artifact, but also continue studying them. And as you find new things that can change the whole story of the site or of the object. So I, I keep, as you were talking, I kept thinking about, wow, this is such a parallel example of um, how, you know, history, the book is not closed on history and new interpretations mm -hmm. can just unlock all these new ideas and thoughts along the way. Yeah, and, so, and I think, I think um, you make a great point there and then I'll get to these questions, I promise. Uh, and that this is a collaborative um, process. You know, the excavators, um, whoever finds it or has the first permission to publish it has a very important job, but they're by no means the last word. And it, it really, it takes, um, takes a lot of people working on this material to, um, to think about it um, repeatedly. Um, can, I, can I get to some of these questions now? Um, yes, oh, please. Excellent. Um, Jennifer Richardson says, what underwater sites are you most interested in for future digs or swims? Oh, um, well, uh, let's see. There's a couple that I know very well, and a couple I'm going to mention that I don't know well at all that I would love to know more about. Um, down in the same area in the Bay of Naples, um, down in the Lake Avernus, it's a volcanic crater lake, um, there is a tunnel that goes through um, the rim of the crater lake and goes down into the rim to an underwater site which seems to be a, um, an initiation site into 
the worship of some sort of chthonic or underground um, deity like Hecate. And it's never been excavated or explored, um, not by professionals. And I would love to see that explored. Um, I really think that deserves a lot of attention because it's a Greek, um, it's a Greek religious um, um, initiation site from probably the sixth century BC that's there um, on private land, just waiting for somebody to get in there and, and find it out. And so um, I think um, I think I would love to see that um, uh, explored. I would also like to see the grotto, the, the blue grotto on Capri explored archeologically um, if they could keep the tourists out of it for any amount of time, um, because it's not been actually systematically excavated and explored. And it's also an underwater dining grotto um, that I think really needs some exploration. Um, that and those are the two that I know of that I really want to see more underwater work done on. And of course, the one that I have no idea what there is, is along the Red Sea coast of Egypt, um, where, um, where the, um, um, the spice trade um, passed from India and China across the Red Sea um, uh, um, and uh, eventually to the Nile and, um, and the, those Red Sea ports need a lot of work. And I'd like to see those Red Sea ports also, um, also explored. Um, there's just not a lot of money for that type of exploration in Egypt. And so um, I'd like to see that done. Okay. Um, so uh, Trenton Farrow says, I want to go back to the dining room in England and then the following saying from Ava, the chronology doesn't seem to work. I was moving pretty fast there, um, I understand. Um, so what, um, what we have um, at the, the Longstone dining room is not um, a quote from Ovid. It is an original couplet that is using Ovidian verse forms. And so it is an original couplet that's designed to allude to the mosaic image of Europa and the bowl in the, and it was written in the fourth century, um, but they use those Ovidian forms from 400 years earlier. So it'd be like me writing um, a Shakespearean sonnet, that would be the day, um, now to, um, to talk about my dining room today, um, to really just make the case of, of my cultural connections. So that I think probably is maybe a closer, uh, a little fuller description of what's going on chronologically there. I hope that helps. Um, is there a, uh, Tom Eisenbrown says, is there a singular event that is attested for Bayai being subsumed or was that a gradual process? Great question. These are all great questions, actually. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so the process there is called Brady Sizem, B R A D Y S E I S M, Brady Sizem. And Brady Sizem is a form of slow, a gradual sub subsuming of, of the land. It sinks. Sometimes it sinks and actually comes back up because of the flow of liquid under that plate. So Bayai is actually on one edge of, not to get too wonky here, one edge of, of the European plate um, where it passes under the African plate. So it's very seismically active there. Um, and um, actually th that coast, um, I've been going back to that coast now for 40 years. Um, and some sites that I visit there sometimes are underwater and some sites are above water year by year, they just gradually float up and down. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, and every year I just go back and just say, okay, I wonder what we're gonna see this year <laughs> because you never know, or at least I don't. Um, it's, uh, so Brady Sizem is the process there, great. Uh, can I elaborate, Wesley Payne asks, can you elaborate on the rehabilitation of Nero's reputation? I would like to believe that my, my daughter, um, gave you that question to ask because I've been, I've been bugging everybody with this for years. Um, um, the British Museum currently has an exhibit on Nero where in fact, the theme of the exhibit is rehabilitating Nero's reputation a bit. And the short answer is that Nero's reputation as we understand it 
comes from largely two written sources, one of which in particular is Suetonius's Life of the Emperors. Now Suetonius was not a contemporary of Nero's. He wrote about 60 years later, and he was what we refer to, to today as a disgruntled former employee. He had been sacked from the imperial administration and he hated the emperors and he wrote terrible things, which actually he went out of his way to write nasty stuff. If you compare what Suetonius writes about Nero with what the historian Tacitus writes about him, what you see is Suetonius' stuff is richly entertaining and has great stories, but actually is not accurate. Um, so for example, the great fire in Rome, Nero wasn't there during the fire. He wasn't there to, to fiddle while Rome burned. He was out of town. But as soon as the fire hit, he came back to town. He supervised um, the fire being put out. He supervised um, the rescue of the homeless. He opened his estates. He cleared out the rubble. He paid for all of this out of his personal pockets. And afterwards, um, he insisted that the rebuilding that took place in Rome um, institute fire codes for the first time. Tacitus tells us all this, but it's just not a real good story. You can't make a good gossipy story out of fire codes. I'm sorry. So, um, so actually Nero, you know, with the great fire, his great thing that he did, you know, destroyed the city, blah, 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 seems to all be pretty bogus. So um, there's just a short example of Nero's um, reputation. There's an article in this month's um, New Yorker about Nero's reputation being rehabilitated. It's available online for free. You can check that out in the New Yorker. Just Google New Yorker Nero and it'll pop right up. Um, ah, Anne Olga Koloski Ostro has a question. Oh, this is dangerous. Um, Anne is, Anne is a colleague of mine and um, knows far more than I do about, well, pretty much everything. In fact, I should, oh, uh, I've got it on the bookcase over here. I was just reading your book. I should hold that up for you. Um, I was just reading your book recently. Okay, sorry. Um, the mosaic that's in the dining room at Piazza Armarina. Um, yeah, so this, um, this actually is the one I alluded to when I said that the Emperor Hadrian had this imagery in his dining room and Maximian. If we assume that Piazza Armarina, the villa there, was Maximian's, which the original excavators said it was, then yes, there is polyphemous imagery there. And so that adds to, um, so you're absolutely right. You remember perfectly correctly, Anne. Um, you, um, um, it is in a dining room there. It's in a niche um, in, uh, in the dining room in the villa at Piazza Armarina. And so Nero has on um, the grotto here at Punta Epitaphio, he has the same imagery in his dining room in the Domus Aurea in Rome, and um, then Hadrian and then Maximian both have the same imagery in their dining rooms as well. Only Maximian's, as I said, or Piazza Armarina is a mosaic. You're right, I didn't mention that. It's not a sculpture, it's a mosaic. Good point, good point. Okay, great. Oh, we are... We are rolling. Okay. There's um, also some very nice comments and thank yous and compliments in the chat for you to read. Um, and I think that's yeah. all the questions that I see. So if anyone has any further questions or, or comments, type them up quickly, submit those now. Um, we'll give you about 30 more seconds for any final thoughts. No pressure, but, but 30 seconds. <laughs> Yes. Well, as those 30 seconds quickly expire, I would just like to say thank you so much for sharing your presentation you. today, for, for sharing about these really interesting underwater sculptures, their connection to mythology, and their changing interpretations over time. Um, of course, we do have two more summer lectures coming up. One last shameless plug for us, uh, July 21st with Dr. Moraitu from the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, Greece. She'll be sharing about conserving underwater artifacts, specifically bronzes. So if you were intrigued by some of those sculptures that had concretions and different le levels of preservation, this will be a great talk for you. 
and we'll be talking about land and underwater archaeological practices on um, August 18th with Dr. Anne DeRay. So once again, thank you so much to all the organizations that have supported this project, Humanities Tennessee, Centennial Park Conservancy, Metro Parks uh, and Recreation here in Nashville. And thank you to Dr. Stephen L. Tuck for sharing his time and expertise today. Thanks for joining thank us, everyone. Thank you so much, Katie. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're the first to know about all the exciting things happening at the Nashville Parthenon.